Welcome to Zeitgeist Radio. I'm your host, Morgan Rowe, founder of the Zeitgeist Academy. Zeitgeist means spirit of the times, and it is the collection of cultural forces that all contribute to what it feels like to be alive and part of a dynamic culture. Every episode, I speak with someone from a unique musical subculture. We dig into their passion and explore how music is a powerful force that brings people together. Before we dive into today's interview, I want to offer you something special. If you're like me, you come out of these interviews with all sorts of questions. Each week, after speaking with one of our amazing guests, I dive into something they introduced us to that I find interesting or important. I write a blog post about it and email a nice tidy bundle to your inbox every two weeks. Never miss an exploration of an awesome musical subculture. Join the Academy and sign up for my free newsletter at zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. My guest today is Alexis Baker, a music therapist and founder and owner of Bridgetown Music Therapy. Alexis, welcome to Zeitgeist Radio. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank so, you. We met um, many, many years ago, um, and I just think what you do is so fascinating. So do you want to start by kind of telling people um, what you do and then what that is? <laughs> sure. That is the question I get the most. So I am a music therapist. And one way I like to break down music therapies into four different elements, and it's using evidence-based music interventions to accomplish goals based on the needs of an individual or group. So that's the first element and the second element. And then the third is that it involves a therapeutic relationship. And the fourth is that therapeutic relationship is a board certified um, and or licensed when required credentialed professional. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of, a lot of words. <laughs> but that's the, the four parts of what is music therapy. And another way I like to kind of break it down and just simplify it is, is music therapy is using music to help people. So it's it's it is goal oriented. There are outcomes you're working towards. Um, but yes, it's at, at its roots. It's using music to help people. I am. I have so many questions. I'm so excited to talk to you about. This. <laughs> I'm excited so, too. Um, what when you say goals, let's start there. Like what types of goals would people have? All kinds, literally anything. Music therapy can be used with any age in many, many different types of settings. So we're talking all the way from like prenatal, like in the womb to like the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit, all the way through through death. So like hospice and end of life care, all ages, lots of different types of settings from like special education to mental health, um, prisons, day centers for people with disabilities, um, older adults, memory care type settings, all kinds of different settings. So it really depends on the the age, the population you're working with, the individual themselves, and what their greatest needs are. It could be their greatest need is to Im increase expressive communication. And music is wonderful for that because we can be so expressive through music. It could be to improve range of motion. So that would be a physical goal. Um, there's all these different domains that goals fall under, like physical, emotional, um, communicative, uh, even spiritual. You can have spiritual goals within music therapy. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So do you specialize in any particular segment of this or do you do it all? What's What's your niche? Well, music therapists are trained to work with many different uh, populations of people. We we learn about a wide variety of disabilities and diseases and all of that. Um, however, I think it's best to specialize, and I do specialize. For the first three years of my professional career, I was working with a variety of populations, all the way from like kids to adults with developmental disabilities. Um, older adults. And it was just such a wide variety. And I was finding that I really wanted to to focus in on the older adult population, specifically dementia patients. 
So that's ultimately what I ended up doing and have been focused in on that space for the past six years. Actually, that's probably right about when I met you is about when you started Bridge. So can, can you tell people about your company? Yes, yes. Bridgetown Music Therapy is my company. I began in uh, kind of late 2016, early 2017. And we are focused on serving the older adult population, specifically uh, people living with dementia, using music to make a difference in their lives. And really, we're really focused on music engagement. So um, helping people engage in music for the benefits that come with that. Like what? <laughs> what are the benefits? I know like that I love music, but um, yeah. So what, what types of things do you see, results do you see from people? Yeah, great question. It could be uh, stress reduction, relieving anxiety. It could be in, like getting them moving more, getting the blood flowing in the body more. So we do a lot of singing, movement to music, and then like deep breathing exercises and relaxation. So just think about those activities and how you yourself benefit from singing, moving to music, music assisted relaxation, and even like using music for um, deep breathing. Like, yeah, using like it the to meditative soundtracks that people may. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can you describe? I mean, I know that you have to be careful with confidentiality, but like, can you give any examples of like some sessions you've had maybe that are really meaningful or like, I don't know, what would a day look like or a session look like with the people that you serve? Yeah, I think the clients that stand out to me the most are the ones where it's like in an in the moment response. For example, um, I had this patient one time who had recently suffered from a stroke and had lost her ability to speak. Um, so she was starting to recover but but wasn't speaking yet and they weren't sure if she was going to be able to uh, recover her speech and I got down at her level her eye level and started singing a song a very familiar song um, that I thought she would know you are my sunshine <laughs> and she started singing with me oh like and words or or sounds words words yeah. And everyone in the room was so amazed. They were like jaw dropped and just like couldn't believe it because she had just suffered from the stroke. And even my mind was blown. I was like, <laughs> so instances like that where clients have found their voice again, whether um, physically from like a stroke or expressively or emotionally, like it could um, it could be from the results of dementia where they are so advanced that they've just kind of retreated within themselves and disengaged with the world around them. Even though they still have a voice, they don't express themselves very often anymore. But through music, they're able to do that. So I love those kind of moments. Is it true that music builds a different pathway to memory in the brain? I've read this somewhere that like, like a song will come on and, you know, like if you have a very specific memory or a time in your life where like this was the song, for example, was on the radio a lot or something um, that. Yes. Like it actually builds a different neural pathway. Is that true? So music affects every area of the brain because of all the different elements music involves. Um, you have rhythm, pitch, timbre, um, lyrics. So there's different areas of the, like we have a speech area in the brain. Right. And um, music can trigger that area or it can sometimes bypass it too. So I don't fully know how to explain it because it gets down to like the physiological. Yes, thing. yes. But yeah, music has an amazing effect on the brain and memories are can be very strongly tied to to music, to specific songs. We form very strong attachments to music especially with like prominent events or memories in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. So, so do you people... use that when you're working with people? Like, do you ask people like, what was your favorite song or what was your, your prom date? Like <laughs> favorite song? Or... Absolutely. Yeah. Music therapy is always about meeting them where they're at and trying to discover what their 
musical preferences are. So it could be preference of a specific style or genre of music or of a specific song, specific singers and artists. Mm -hmm. Um, So just trying to discover that, what that is for them, and what memories they might have tied to specific music. Um, Mainly positive memories. I was going to say, you could go both ways with that. (laughs) It can go both ways. And that's one one caution in music therapy, for sure, is you always want to be mindful of the effect music can have, both positive and negative. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So let's go back a little bit. How in the world did you decide to go into this? Where did you start? Where did you learn about music therapy? And what led to that decision to pursue this? Yes, I was hoping we'd circle back to that question. (laughs) So I first learned about music therapy in high school. I think I was about 16. And I was at that point where I was trying to decide what I was going to pursue as a career what I was going to study in college. And I I always knew that I wanted to do something that involved helping people. I am a helper at heart. That's uh, just kind of my disposition. And so I was like, maybe I'll go into counseling or become a nurse. But I learned very quickly that nursing wasn't going to work out for me <laughs> for a variety of reasons. And um, I had always loved music. So I was thinking, like, there's got to be something that involves music. However, I didn't want to go the traditional routes of performance or music education. Yeah. Did you play in, in an instrument in high school or sing in a choir or something? Yes. Yeah, so I, I started taking lessons when I was eight. I began with piano and then picked up guitar when I was 10. So I've been playing music for a while and grew up in kind of a musical family. All my siblings played instruments and we had a family band at one point. Nice. So that's awesome. Always been surrounded by music. Love it. Loved it and wanted to do something that involved music. And then I, it was a few things all at once. I overheard a classmate mention that she was hoping to go into music therapy and my ears kind of perked up like, oh, what's that? Like, that sounds like it could be interesting. And then I stumbled across an article on a music therapist and I just naturally started looking into it, like what it what it involves. I I discovered that it is an actual profession and thing you can go into for work and study in school. And then from there, I began researching schools that had a music therapy program I imagine and, there's not that many. Like I, I was know. about seventy in the U.S. Seventy. Okay. I, that that may be an old number. I don't know what the most current is, but yeah, not not too many. So, yeah, I did running start in college, where I was finishing my high school credits at community college, and I was already starting to take music classes like music theory and ear training and choir and and um just kind of going that route already yeah but when I learned about music therapy it just kind of clicked and like I knew and I was like yeah this is for me so it was one of those things where I just like I knew right away like it was my path and calling and then I uh transferred down to a university in Portland Oregon and completed their music therapy program. It's a four-year degree. It's kind of a double major because you're doing the music, you're doing all the music classes yeah, or the music foundation, and then you're also studying um, psychology and inner uh, theory and practice of therapy. Sure. So you're getting that training to become a therapist, so it's kind of a double major. It's very intense. And then after you finish the coursework, you have to complete a minimum full-time six-month internship, which amounts to about 1,200 hours. So um, I did all of that, and then I became board certified, and that involves taking a a test and passing and and then just maintaining certification, which is a five-year cycle, and doing continuing ed credits and all of that. So yeah, I've been... 
certified music therapist for about 10 years now. I'm just about to hit my 10 year mark. So it's been a wild ride. (laughs) What was your first job out of college? Did you work for someone else? I did. Yes, because I wanted to get I just wanted to get experience initially. And so I I worked for the same company that I did my internship with. They hired me right out of my internship. It was super part time. Um, So I ended up kind of funny, never planned this, but I ended up becoming a nanny, a part time nanny to supplement my income. Sure. Um, They could only offer me very part time. So I just wanted to to get started with that and get that initial experience. And I was with them for about three years. And then I became brave enough to go off and start my own. (laughs) And that is very brave. (laughs) It was really scary at first, but I did it. Yes. And here you are still many years later. That's that's so awesome. What was, do you remember the first patient you ever treated? Well, I. One of the first. Yeah. Okay. So in school, we're required to do nine. It was nine quarters of practicum. So I had, and that was part of getting those required hours. So my very first practicum experience was an observation. And it was at a Kaiser hospital on an oncology unit, so cancer patients. And it was super intense for like a first music therapy experience because I had never experienced it up to that point. And I was shadowing a music therapist and she was like in the room while this patient was receiving chemo, like doing a a guided meditation, relaxation type intervention with her. And it was very powerful. But I also realized early on that the hospital setting wasn't for me because I I got kind of lightheaded and had had to step out of the room. And I was like, I don't I don't know if I can handle this. It's really intense. Wow. But yeah, that was my very first experience, although that wasn't myself treating someone. Um, And then after that, I had a few different practicums in um, elder care settings, and that's where I really fell in love with them. Um, You just like bringing a smile to someone's face through music is one of my most favorite things. And I've I've gotten to do that. So like I've witnessed that so much yeah. over the years. And that was something that really stood out to me is just how you can. It's such a simple thing, but how you can brighten someone's day. Bringing, well, I, and that's not a simple thing at all. You know, in some of these cases, it's very stressful and very um, scary. Yeah, so that's sure. a huge thing <laughs> to brighten someone's day. Um, what is it specifically about dementia? Can you go, I mean, we don't have to go super science-y, but, but how does, um, dementia and, and music therapy tie together? Dementia is a symptom. It's kind of an umbrella term. Okay. It covers a lot. Um, so Alzheimer's is a degenerative disease and involves dementia. Um, dementia can be memory loss. It can be behavioral changes. It can be a lot of different things and manifest in a lot of different ways. Um, there are, are many challenges associated with dementia and music is super powerful with, with dementia. And there's been so much, um, research and studies on, on how music affects people living with dementia. And oh, it's one of those things where it's like so hard to explain. But when you see it with your own eyes, like it, you just it, you get it. It clicks and um, makes sense. But music can have a calming effect on people with dementia. It can help them be expressive. It can help engage them cognitively when they're struggling to engage cognitively in other ways. And it also makes things fun. Like if if you're trying to get someone with dementia to do something like you can bring music into it and make it more fun, make it more enjoyable experience. So, um, yeah, it's not just one thing. It's many different things. Sure, sure. Um, so you shared something uh, in our communications before the interview about kind of your your journey through COVID. <laughs> 
and what you've done with your business. Um, can you kind of share like the, I don't think I've heard of a of another music therapist having a business model like you do now. And I'm really curious to hear about about what you're doing. Yes, it's very new, unique. And I think I mentioned something like I'm I like to call myself a non-traditional music therapist now because what I'm what I'm currently doing looks a lot different than what formal in-person music therapy looks like. Um, so COVID was a huge I don't want to say speed bump, but it was more of a, it was more than a speed bump. <laughs> yes. Um, COVID was just huge. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. prior to COVID, I had been serving senior care communities in the Portland area. I had about two dozen contracts with care communities um, and I would go to them in person. So I was yeah. doing a lot of driving. Yeah. I would um, drive around to all these care care communities and bring my instruments and facilitate music therapy sessions with groups mostly groups of residents so that the residents yeah, I was going to ask if it was it groups or or one on ones yeah i had a few individual clients but mostly groups of the residents and that's super beneficial for them because it gives them an opportunity to interact with each other and yeah keep... socially socially yes yeah and i imagine that a lot of the well, it depends, I guess. Um, but those communities, the age groups are sort of similar enough that you could like play some Beatles and they'd all connect, right? <laughs> like, like, yeah. Because isn't it like during our teen years is like super formative for yes, teen, for connecting with music and twenties is and twenties is the years of music we connect with the most. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of a general rule of thumb in in music therapy yeah so I know that some people end up in communities like that that are younger maybe they've had an right. accident or something but mm -hmm. um but yeah that yeah be it can be a pretty wide age range sometimes like a 50 50 yeah. you could have someone who's 60 and then you could literally have someone who's 100 yeah yeah that's true um, so that can be a little challenging but anyways um I would work with groups of residents and uh, that was my that was my work and that was my day to day. And then COVID began and one by one, my. Um, yeah, that's like the most vulnerable population. <laughs> yes. yes. So I was first to like be affected by COVID compared to like the the outside, the. Yeah. Rest of society. Um. <laughs> So all my all of my clients canceled services, understandably. Um, yes. I was considered an outside vendor, and they were not allowing anyone outside to come in, and that was all I was doing. So my uh, my work went from fully functioning to nothing. Oh, so and, stressful. <laughs> yeah, it was really stressful. It, I it was kind of like a freak out at first, and then like paralyzed, and then panic and just like all these different emotions all at once very disorienting like what do I do now like yeah. what what is my life all about yeah but um yeah it was a probably a, a couple a few weeks of nothing and then I began trying different things like um music therapy over zoom which kind of has its challenges with the technology and the the lag with it's it's harder to do music over a live uh, yeah. path with the with the lag and um, connection issues and things like that. And then I I was doing a little bit of outdoor music therapy where I would like sit just outside a window or outside a door, and the, the residents would be inside. But that only works a, a few months out of the year in the Northwest. Sure. <laughs> um, um, I guess props for creativity though. <laughs> I even had one site I was doing music therapy over the phone. Like it was just the audio, nothing yeah. else. Um, nothing really panned out and uh, things were just super slow. Everybody was stressed in the senior care industry and yeah. just spread thin and trying to get everything under control. And um, music therapy was kind of like. It's like when it's most needed is when yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's, so I was like, I I kept thinking like I could help so much right now. Like yes. 
everybody's stressed and residents are isolated and they just need something. But um, I wasn't allowed. <laughs> so uh, then it, then several more months went by and um, my husband and I were had been talking about like, what's the future of my business? Like, what should we do? And he's trained as a as a videographer. He's a professional videographer. So we're like, what if we teamed up and put our skills together and began creating videos of pre-recorded sessions, essentially? So we started doing that kind of as a test and had several people jump on um, as members and just went from there. And And that's what I've been doing since. And we've in the past two, two and a half years, um, have built up a library of over 300 videos. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so it became this, like, it's really grown into this big yes. thing. Um, we have a membership type model where uh, when they sign up and it could be a, an individual, a group or community, and they get access to our video library, so where all the sessions are. And it's a mix of individual songs, 60-minute um, sessions, and then 30-minute sessions. And the sessions are a variety of music, or they're themed. And it's a lot of focus on singing and then, and then uh, getting them moving. So gentle stretching and just movement to music, and then that relaxation piece with the, like, Deep, focus on deep breathing and just yes i love this so much <laughs> there's like because it's like what they need it's just like access whenever right yes 24 so, 7 access yeah, so like whenever like especially for the stress stuff like if like you could be stressed out at any particular time of day and or or several times in the same day and you could still go on and yeah, watch one and of these videos and just calm down and and then maybe an hour later you need it again <laughs> and you can yeah, we like to yeah. say that it's great for any time of day whether it's um 2 p.m or 2 a.m because yeah. a lot of times there's with alzheimer's and dementia there's sundowning behavior which is like an early evening time of day and then there's there can be behavioral issues at night where they have trouble sleeping, they're restless, anything like that. So it really does come in handy with um, evening. So a lot of communities, they plan activities throughout the whole day from yeah. like 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., but then they don't really have anything in the evening. So right. evening activity or even just on demand, like as needed. When right. Needed. right, right, right. Yeah. That's <laughs> just so like, I don't know, to me that feels so spot on <laughs> and like perfect for people um i assume that it's caregivers that would maybe have to be actually pulling up the videos and stuff a lot of the times yes so caregivers activity professionals um the ones leading activities I, if it's an in-home setting then a family member a caregiver whoever is there helping get it right get it. yeah yeah how do you organize these videos? Because that's so many. <laughs> like, if I were to log on and see 300, I'd be like, okay, I'm logging off. <laughs> it is a lot. Yes. And we do, we do um, program demos and, and show people, like, we give them a tour of, mm -hmm. like, the video library and how it all works and give them ideas um, because it can be a little overwhelming. But we have, uh, we call them collections. So we have different categories. Um, I mentioned the individual songs, right? We have about 150 songs. And then we have. So 30... is that like just like on the on the site? It's just the one song. Is it yes. a collection so, of songs or one song? It's one song if you're in the individual song. OK, OK. Collection. And those videos are like, I mean, one song is like three to four to five yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, and that's like if somebody has a favorite song and you just want to pull up that favorite song or maybe you just want to do one or two or three songs gotcha. and then you're done. Gotcha. But then we have 30, 25 to 30 minute sessions and we have those by variety sessions where it's just like a mix of music and then we have themes and it can be anything from like holiday theme. Sure. So kind of random like we have waltzes and it's all waltzes and 
um, songs that are blue and it's all songs that have blue in the title. It's just like fun, like women's names and um, Hawaiian theme. So just totally fun themed. So those are like curated playlists, sort of. Yeah. They yeah. Have maybe some activities in there, too. Yep. And then um, and then we have the full length, the hour, 50 to 60 minute sessions. And then we have we did a whole like winter holiday collection. That's Christmas and holiday music. Yeah. And we have a patriotic theme and we're still creating new content. So we're always like putting we release new content monthly. And we're working on a hymns collection because a lot of older adults like really relate to those hymns and spiritual songs. Um, We'll do a whole movement collection where it's all songs for movement and lots of other plans in the works. (laughs) You also want to bring in other musicians. Um, For example, I have a music therapy colleague who's a harpist. And it would be amazing to do like harp music and perhaps like relaxation focused sessions with yes. hearts yes so, oh, yeah see, wanna... i'm getting excited listening to all of this there's so much <laughs> the mission of the zeitgeist academy is simple i want everyone to live their best musical life If your dream includes singing with confidence, I got you. I made a mini online course so you can get out of musical drama and finally understand which vocal elements make you sound good. Banish forever those fears of being out of key, off rhythm, and other assorted mayhem. Step into your best musical life, my friends. Sign up for the free course at zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. So years, I, for several years, um, including, I think when I, first met you I was in a group um a performing ensemble as a choir but they were geared towards performing in assisted living communities and the music was from the 50s and 60s and early 70s so oh, nice um, and I just it, remember like we we the the director Don Anderson incredible man um and he has these visions for these concerts and they were all themed and so I've seen a little bit of what you probably see every day, but like I just remember certain there are certain memories from my time in that group that were very poignant. Like like people would come in to our concerts and they'd be like wheeled in in their wheelchairs and they'd be just they'd look super out of it and they're like they'd be slumped mm-hmm. over, probably not you know like not making eye contact with anybody. And then we'd start singing and they knew all this music. Like, again, the director, like, programmed stuff. Even down to radio commercials. Like, we did a whole radio hour thing. And it was like... Oh, that's awesome. Like, commercials for shampoo that, like, they they don't exist anymore. But you know how jingles get in your ear and just stay there? (laughs) And everyone was singing along to these commercials for, like, shampoo or, like, heartburn medication (laughs) or whatever that were on TV at the time. And I just remember particularly this one lady, by the time we left an hour later, she was like sitting upright and her eyes were bright and she was like engaged and she'd totally come in, just wheeled in, like all slumped over. And I'm like, wow, that was like such a moment for me to watch that transformation in her over an hour. Yeah, that's a perfect example. So that's a lot of time. That's often what I would see going into these care communities is they're withdrawn maybe their heads down and they're they're just engaged with the world they're um maybe they're not in a good mood and like and then you start singing and it's like a 180 like they they flip and they're they perk up and like they start singing and by the end of the session they're like they're happy and upbeat and yeah i there was uh one community i used to go to I think it was in my internship and a, one of the nurses said music about this one client in particular uh music is the only thing that brings her to life. Oh my gosh. So you just picture that like there's not much there and then they're suddenly like full of life again. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So powerful. Yeah. I have a friend from um choir um developed Parkinson's and um, he ended up in one of these communities and we actually came and sang for the song so I was like oh hey I know you 
Um, and he said that even after he couldn't sing in the Portland Symphonic Choir anymore, he always kept in choir. They had a choir there. And I was like, oh, that's good. You're so you're still singing. And he turned and looked at me like the most intense look. And he's like, if I stop singing, I die. And I was like, whoa. Wow. But like, that's what like, that's how strongly he's like, I need to sing like physically in order to manage my Parkinson's. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a physical, physical need, but also uh like it gives him purpose and meaning yeah involved in music yeah yeah um, it was again some just kind of like very intense <laughs> memorable moments there for sure yeah love that what are some like funny stories that you've seen have you seen people just be like totally silly or like go over the top with something <laughs> absolutely like i i think of moments where it's totally unexpected like somebody just gets up and starts dancing or um with alzheimer's specifically is just like the confusion that sometimes comes into play and um like with some of the instruments i would bring in or i also brought in like scarves for movement to help sure. like as a as a prop for for movement um and like you know those little egg shakers mm -hmm. i would have some people just like stick them down their pants or something <laughs> oh, they're just gotcha. like knocking it away for later like they they don't quite understand why it's in their hand right <laughs> oh, they're like well i must need this for later so <laughs> so i'll put it in my pants <laughs> yeah, but I, you're like i'm gonna wash this acting <laughs> oh, yeah. is a must <laughs> yeah. um some really sweet moments though is is like after a set you know the effects of music can carry on they can yeah they can be post session too not just in the moment and moments where you end a session and the residents are all like scattering and dispersing and the caregivers are helping them walk away and they're just like chugging along in their with their walker and singing like on their yes. own without yes. me they're singing the song the last song we sang or something like that where it's like it's so sweet it's just so sweet oh that's awesome so what type of movement stuff is it is it straight up dancing or I mean I imagine with the older adults it's a little challenging to do like full dance yeah. stuff but what what type of movement is there we mostly do seated movement okay uh because there are fall risks yeah in care communities so you just you always got to be mindful of that um especially with um with my my online program I'm not there physically and I'm sure. not them as they interact so I always recommend they have a caregiver or a, a personnel staff personnel present yes <laughs> to just kind of monitor all that um but mostly like gentle stretching so you want to get older adults you want to prompt them to move but um you want to avoid injury or or strain in some way so it's mostly gentle like stretching arms above the head um but I do facilitate songs that like we move to the music so using elements of the mu music the rhythm the beat um the words I'll sometimes sing the the movements we're doing as like a prompt um yeah, the, um, that, I, the one the choir that I was in um, several times, a song that that made a frequent reappearance was um, the hand jive. We would do the hand jive. And oh, it was oh, funny because oh. I I had never heard of this, but everywhere we would go, like we'd start doing the, you know, the like the little hand movements things and over the shoulder and the fist together. Yes. I would say half, like probably 50 percent of the people in the audience knew what it was. And then the rest of it were, you know, trying to learn and follow along with the director as, as he went through the hand jive. <laughs> like, That's so fun. I can do the hand jive now. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I've done, I mean, I've done the YMCA. Uh, the Macarena. The Macarena? Wait, isn't that like from the 90s? <laughs> yes, I know, but it's adaptable. So you yeah. can adapt. It doesn't have to be with the original song. Sure, sure. Which you can take the movements alone yeah. and apply them to other songs so that's what I mean it's adaptable um 
<laughs> yeah. And how like, funny is that? That was look amazing to see like all these people and they're like, you know, 70s to 90s doing the Macarena. <laughs> it's so fun. And then I always encourage people to just be creative and move however they feel like there's no right or wrong. And I mean, with with video, it is one sided. So I'm I'm not interacting with them live in the moment mm -hmm. in person anymore. But the way I feel like the, the way I interact with the camera is all about engaging them in the music. So I'll I'll say things like, hey, let's sing like let's let's yeah. give this a try like will you sing with me and just like di using different prompts in a natural way not like it's all about like having fun and, and yeah yeah just yeah. get it like getting them to engage in the music and then also um with it being a dement we call it a dementia friendly program because it's really uh created to cater to people living with dementia so we keep things simple and um, slower. So the pace to to us, the pace might seem pretty slow, but sure. uh, people living with dementia do process things slower. So you don't want to slow it down too much because you don't want to dumb it down. But um, yeah, slower pace, keeping it simple so that, to avoid overstimulation. Sure. And then just like the, the cadence of things, sometimes I pause and like allow time for them to respond even though I'm not like even though I don't see their response like it's meant to be engaging and um responsive and, yeah. and active participation yeah I can sort of relate just because I've created an online course too it's it's geared a little differently but like I will play you know it's my courses on how to sing and it's like I'll play the warm-up and then I'll give them time to do the warm-up so like just, and that's just comes from years of teaching and I'm sure it's the same for you you just you know yes. what how the, the cadence goes years of teaching I know that they're going to need a little moment to you know do whatever um exactly. and of course they can pause the video if they need more time so yeah, I actually exactly. think for for some you know areas that might work better is if they do need more time they can just you know pause they can hit the space bar and just or you know the character of can and, and give them any extra time they need yeah and that's the beauty of video too is it's mm -hmm. like totally at your fingertips, at your control. I took my years of experience interacting with clients in the moment and put that into video format because yeah. you really do like learn how to interact with people from years of doing it. You get yeah. all the experience and, and then you can take that and apply it to video format. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's so exciting to me because like when I look at that like you're able to help potentially so many more people than you would be able to physically drive from one place to another to another. And then it's all in Portland. Well, what if someone lives in maybe a more rural area and they're not able to come, you know, like travel as much and they have a family member taking care of them? They still need this, you know, it's and you're making true. that accessible now. It's true. And I uh, two reasons for that. Like I got really burned out on all the driving I was doing. So now it's like ugh, such a relief to not have to drive anymore. Yeah. Um, but it's also true that there are not enough music therapists to go around to yes. serve everyone. Like there just aren't. There's about, I think there's about 9,000 music therapists in the U.S., but they don't all work in the senior care industry. Like, right. We work in hospitals and schools and lots of other different types of settings. So only a percentage of them work with older adults. And there are thousands upon thousands of individuals living at home. Right. For one, but also like all the care communities. And like you mentioned, they're like rural areas where there's there's no music therapist to serve those places but if they have internet and like internet is pretty much available anywhere now mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> or rural might be a little challenging but um yeah anywhere they have internet and they can they can play the videos on a smart tv or a laptop a tablet a phone or they can connect their phone to the tv and play it from like there's so many different options because right. we're all used to like pulling up videos and playing them now yeah. Uh, YouTube <laughs> got us used to that. So it's it's 
it is kind of a newer idea in the care, the senior care yeah. industry. But I mean, video is the way of the future. Like everything's shifting to video. So yeah. we're like, we're going to be pioneers. <laughs> there we go. I love that. And actually, this is um side note here. I'm thinking my, so my grandmother lives um in a community facility we got her a um they make these like little boom boxes basically with just two yeah. buttons super simple she's blind but she loves audiobooks and music and it's just there's yeah. a stop play button and there's a skip button and just those two right so even though she's blind she can still you know find usually those two buttons by touch and that thing a According to my mom, that thing has like completely changed her life and her experience just to have music constantly going. And you have to like load stuff onto it, right? So like my when my mom goes up to visit, she'll like update it. You know, if um myself or I have a, a very musical cousin as well who's, you know, makes recordings, they'll put that on there or, you know, music that just new new variety. Um, they'll add that onto her boombox. And even just that is like the difference in her is so drastic oh that's that's wonderful and that's yeah that just is an example of how technology has made so many things possible Mm -hmm. and made things more accessible um could your videos be downloaded and put on like like for people who are maybe blind or can't you know see we haven't done that yet where it's like just the audio yeah and i'm not sure what type of device that is yeah exactly. this just played uh, like an mp3 or a wave file okay yeah um there, there's always a way though yeah there's yeah. A- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and that's the beauty of technology is there's there's always a way to do something yeah uh so does your you mentioned there's two levels again? I'm just so fascinated by this model because I think it's I think it's so interesting. Um, you mentioned that there's families and then that there's also like a facility. Are those like just the do the facilities get like different content or is it all the same or like how does is it like a group? Dis- yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So we ended up rebranding in the fall this past okay. fall. And creating two separate programs, the one for individuals is called Singing at Home. Okay. Because it's typ- typically an in-home setting. Yeah. Um, and then for groups and communities, it's called Music with Alexis. <laughs> sure. So creative. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then with each program type, there's three membership options. We have month to month, six months, and 12 months. And that's just the the length of time you get access. Another thing we do, I forgot to mention. Um, so we release new content monthly. That's part of it. They get access to the whole video library. It's not like this part, but not that. It's just you get yeah. all the videos because yeah. then you have them like whenever you want to use them, even like the, the winter, the yeah. holiday collection. Um, I mean, that that makes sense to have that available in the winter. But some people with dementia, some just, people love Christmas a lot. Christmas in July. So it's available all year. That's true. We also have a member toolbox with um, lots of different resources and and things like that. And then we also do a monthly uh, live session with two cool i was gonna ask about that yeah yeah so that is live in the moment (laughs) um over zoom yeah and it's available to anyone it's actually free so you don't have to be a member to join it um we have two time options and it's always a themed a themed session it's about an hour long and they're just a lot of fun uh i think the highest month we had just over a hundred registrations and they were like all over the country so see that is so cool it's really growing and like the people who participate there you can tell like you can see it on the screen and they use the chat box and if it's like a community there's like a staff member running the chat box and but they're getting input from the residents and um 
you can, if they have their camera on, you can just like see in their faces that they're engaged and they're, or they're singing or whatever. And they're just so appreciative and, um, yeah, they've, they've really been loving it. So that's something we've been doing since last summer and it's been going really well. So we'll continue yeah, that. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And you'll provide links. So if people want to join, um, As, it'll be in the, yes, it's in open the description of this episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. as someone is, what would you say to someone who's maybe like caring for an older parent or is like, you know, maybe there's a concern about Alzheimer's dementia? Is there any like, is there stuff that can be done like preemptively? Like at what point would you recommend someone like start researching music therapy? Yeah, good question. There is so much research being done right now on yeah. dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, I think there are ways to like to slow it down. I, not necessarily reverse it. That would be yeah really tough to like reverse it, but you can definitely slow it down mainly by staying active, like as active as you can physically, mentally, socially. That's mm -hmm. super important. Like COVID was so detrimental with social interaction and just the isolation that took place and then the the compounding the resulting effects of isolation and loneliness mm -hmm. um so sad to think about all of that um yeah I mean music can be used at any point along the way any like it's it's good at any any point so um I always even though like I'm I'm not doing formal music therapy right now I'm always an advocate for it so if um if you're able to hire a music therapist um or join a music therapy group or something like that a wellness mm -hmm. a music wellness group there's like general music wellness classes and things like that um I, I always advocate for that um but we are music therapists are limited like there's not yeah. enough of us to go around like I yeah. said well and I think you told me like years ago too that didn't I mean schools have closed too like didn't your program Yes, well, the entire university is closed. Yes, my school closed in 2018. So thankfully, there was a second, a uh, newer program good that had opened. But yeah, it's it's pretty limiting, and it's um and then COVID was a huge hurdle within the music therapy mm -hmm. profession and in the training part of it. Um, a lot of internships closed and. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you couldn't uh -huh. go to hospitals like the, your yeah. your experience is there. No way for a Don't. cancer patient. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's it was nearly impossible to do my job, even when things started to open up, like trying to sing for an hour with a mask. Like, it's just yeah. so hard. And I couldn't bring instruments in. They like they weren't allowed. Yeah. Um, it was just so limiting. And then like. I had to be six to 10 feet from my clients. So right. like you just miss out on so much. You have a mask. So you're not like they're not able to see your mouth and like your facial expressions. And the the engagement and the interaction was just so limited. I I really felt like COVID took the fun out of my job. And that's yeah. that's part of like the burnout I went through is like the, all the driving I was doing. And then and then COVID and just like I things are things are opened up again and and pretty much back to normal and I and I could go back to doing that but I can't do this whole online thing yeah it's a full-time job now so I'm I'm doing this full-time and I really see it as a new direction for mm -hmm. my business and have just like fully embraced it and and it really does serve a need in a different way like in a different way yeah 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 it's it's not formal music therapy um ev everything has its place and its value and you can you can even have both like we say even if you have a music therapist like you can have our program in the yeah. off hours and, yeah um it can fill those times when you can't have 
like music therapists typically aren't on call. Right. <laughs> You're not going to show up at 2 a.m. to help someone go back to sleep. <laughs> right. But to have a program that's on demand is is basically having someone on call that can provide music, even if it's just even if it's through a video mm-hmm. format. So, yeah, I I lost track of your original question. <laughs> what if this, you know, like, it was kind of like, is there anything preventive that people can do? And I think you definitely answered that. Like, yes, absolutely. Staying active. And there's there's a lot of research on like diet, too, mm-hmm. which that can totally affect things. But yeah, just all the all the usual health mm-hmm. health focused things really help to combat the effects of aging and dementia yeah one of the um coaches i've had for just for physical fitness said something that really stuck with me which was um it was talking about like doing squats or something um and how ultimately that is just the ability to get out of the chair and how (laughs) when you can no longer get out of a chair your health really starts to go downhill because suddenly your social is inter, you know, interactions are limited. Like it kind of cascades everything. Um, and I don't know. That's, that's so true. With me. Yeah. Is it true? Yeah. And I've also heard a body in motion stays in motion. So if you're if you're constantly mo- not constantly moving, but yeah. if you're moving every day, then yeah. you're keeping your body in motion and moving and it's less likely to get injured because of inactivity or strained or yeah. yeah I the choir I'm in now you can sense that I've just been in choir forever <laughs> but the choir I'm in now um there's someone that I I carpool with who's um I forget she's I think she's 82 super active she was a nurse and she's just like go 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 and she she complains so loudly and it's hilarious because she's like, oh, I'm just I'm so, I'm sorry. I'm so slow. She's not slow. She's like, you know, getting out of a car and she's like, I'm sorry. I'm so slow. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going camping for four days. I'm doing this. We're going hiking. We're going like she's just constantly and she's but she's mad that she's like she was complaining the other day like, oh, I can't I can't haul a 50 pound backpack up a mountain anymore. It's like, wow, you're 82. And that's what like. That's just awesome. I don't know. I mean, I like I understand that must be very frustrating, but the fact that she's right. still able to go camping and hiking at at 82 yeah. is just so awesome. It's so awesome. Yeah, that sounds really impressive to me. <laughs> and she stays in choir too. Um she's in I think at least two groups that I'm aware of, which again, she says for the the social and then the I mean just the benefits of singing. Deep breath. Totally. Yeah. There's so many benefits to singing. Yeah. I I also have a blog and I've done a few different posts on like singing, like benefits of singing. And another one that would be worth checking out for caregivers is seven ways to use music at home with your loved one. That was another um, article I wrote. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I have one final question for you. Uh, so, do you know what Zeitgeist means? That's not the question, but yeah. I have heard you share the the meaning before, and I've also looked it up too. Yeah. So, spirit of the times, right? Um, so, for me, and like with my anthropology background, I just i I think that music is is such an important part of culture, and I think that, like we've talked about today, the music that we're around plays a big role in who we are and who we become and what we connect with. So there's something that I call a zeitgeist moment, which is, you know, when you're like listening to music and you just like, you just like feel connected to everything. You're like, oh my gosh, I just get it. Or like you either plug into something or you're just consumed by the music. It just You just feel it really, really strongly and you feel connected to a broader thing, whether it's culture or something universal or whatever. Um, I kind of started calling that a zeitgeist moment. Because we, it's something we've all experienced. Yes, so, absolutely. What was a recent zeitgeist moment for you? Oh, man. Well, um, my husband and I went to Ireland over the whole, over like Christmas and New Year's. And prior to that, I was like, let's get in the, in the spirit for Ireland. So we ended up going to this uh, trio I think they're called the Gothard Sisters, and they do like Irish style of music. And yeah, I just, 
I really loved it. Like it was, you know, how concerts were on hold with COVID and it was, I I don't know if it was our first concert Mm. back. It might have (laughs) been, but that just feeling the power of music again, like in the moment at a, at a concert in person and being there with other people and they also incorporated Irish dancing um, with like the the hard toed shoes. I don't know what those are called. Yeah. Uh, the tap shoes, I guess. And yeah, just feeling the rhythm. And they did a couple of Christmas songs and invited the audience to sing and just being there with everyone singing. And yeah, I would. There was a period that. like as as COVID was was like as things were starting to open back up again, where like every concert you went to, at least for me, like the, the, uh, the um, performers just were crying. Like they were so happy to be back on stage in front of people. And that feeling, I saw several people that were like just overwhelmed, like at how (laughs) much they're like, I knew I missed this, but I didn't realize how much I missed it. And I know for sure that was true for me too. The first like concert that I went back to, I was like crying. (laughs) Was like mm-hmm. this is like I miss this so much yeah mm-hmm. oh awesome is there anything else you'd like to share with people uh one thing I like to share is that music is like a vitamin so a little bit every day does wonders for body soul and mind and spirit and yeah just remember to do something music related every day Take your music vitamin. <laughs> your musical vitamin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> awesome. Well, Alexis, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Oh, thank you. This has been wonderful. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Zeitgeist Radio. To uplevel your musical journey and become a music student for life, join the Zeitgeist Academy by signing up for my bi-weekly newsletter. You'll get exclusive content, blog posts, and behind-the-scenes insights. I love putting it together, and you'll love reading it. Head over to zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. That's Z-E-I-T-G-E-I-S-T academy.com slash radio. Music for this episode was created by Ian Boswell. Please hit that subscribe button and tell all your friends you found a cool new podcast. See you next time.